Well, good morning again. It is so nice to look out and to see all of you. I, um, Randy shared about the first time that we met, and our ministry actually first started gathering women in your children's hallway. And we just had some of our women from like 11, 12, 13 years ago gather and reminisce. And most of us, my kids were like this tall when I started, and now they're this tall. <laughs> and that's the same as a lot of the women in, um, in those years. And so we reminisced and we were talking about, we would order the little Caesar pizza from the, yeah, that way. I'm directionally very challenged. So little Caesar pizza, veggie tail movie. And if we had 15 minutes without a kid crawling on us, we were like, it's good. So if you stay for the Q&A, I would love to share how this ministry has grown and we have a center actually. We, we have moved past Little Caesar Pizza and Veggie Tales, both of which are still amazing, but we have gone um, a lot deeper to event nights and mentorship and courses and a residential program that you also as a church inspired this community. Your house is being used to restart women that have lived lives that encompass harm and abandonment, and they are receiving healing and having a chance to financially get on their feet so that their kids can thrive and thrive for years to come. And that has sparked a movement where there is a tiny house in our community and an apartment and a granny flat, all at which people give freely of and we put our programming inside of. So beautiful things by the grace of God have come forth and I want to sincerely, sincerely thank you. We could go through the list of all the services we do, but I have a beautiful new board member that when we asked the golden question, why do you wanna come on the single mom board? She was like, you know, because at the core, you're the first call when they want to celebrate some success. And sometimes you're the last call at the end of the day when they don't think they can keep going. And she says, that's family. And when you know that family is coming for you, you can stay stronger. You can say, it's gonna be okay. I can do this with my family. So at the heartbeat of Single Mom, we look at all of you as family all the many other people in community as family, and that we extend that love to these women. So on behalf of the 2,000 plus families that we're engaged with, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so now on to the sermon. <laughs> when I was asked to do this, um, this is my normal. This is kind of what goes through my head. The first thing that goes through my head is, I feel very ill-equipped. <laughs> the second thing that goes through my head is, okay, I know kind of what I'm not. I didn't go to school through seminary, so I'm not standing up here as a pastor. Um, but God is so good at gently reminding me who I am. I'm sure you guys know the same feeling that when we doubt, God speaks to who we are. And he reminded me that I am a child of his, that I have been enriched through thousands of stories of women, and that daily I have the honor, the privilege, and sometimes the hard fact that I wake up and I walk onto the local mission field. And I've had this blessing for 13 years now in our community. These verses are what came to mind when I prepared. In Revelations 12, 11, we see the victory of Christ being spoken against the great accuser. And it says that they will overcome him, the great accuser, our enemy, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony. Is that not amazing? We all have a testimony. We're all a part of this together. And then in 1 Peter 3, 15, it tells us, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do this in gentleness and respect. 
So that is my hope today as I share with you to use a part of my testimony, what my eyes see on a daily basis, um, to share with you a little bit about the Great Commission. So I know as a church family, your focus verse has been Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and I'd like to read that before I get started. But Jesus came and spoke these words to them, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You then are to go and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So my first question that I had laid on my heart when I was going back to these verses and looking at it is, well, we are supposed to go, but like, where do we go from? What is it that inspires us to take that step forward to really go? And the words that came back to me is we, we go from abiding in him. We go from being attached to him we do not go apart from him. It's that heart posture that says, here, Lord, here I am in all my imperfections. Please, if it's your will, send me. But how do we nurture that abiding spirit? How do we nurture that heart posture? I used to think that you willed it into being. If you just tried harder, you would abide better. And I got exhausted. <laughs> I don't know if you can at all relate to that. But um, here is a little bit of how I learned to abide without the striving. So I was equipped at a very young age. When I was 18 and 19, I joined a ministry down in Texas, and I was poured into the word missions, international missions, local missions. I received such rich knowledge and for sure wisdom, but a lot of knowledge from books, from speakers. It was kind of like a year and a half of trying to drink from a fire hose and being inundated with all of that. I also, in that moment, would go on retreat. Retreat means to pull away. A great general knows when to say, we need to retreat. It doesn't mean that we're gonna lose the battle, Sometimes we just have to pull in. And this ministry taught me to start to retreat. And in those quiet spaces, I started to learn about this posture, this saying, okay, Lord, here I am. I don't know how many of you um, have read or are inspired or maybe acquainted with Elizabeth Elliot, the late Elizabeth Elliot, but she has been profoundly impactful in my life. This is Jim Elliot's wife, and she has written so much. You could, you could spend a lifetime reading all of her material and listening to her recordings. Um, but she talks so much about having this, this quiet, quiet heart, this place where when the storm comes, we stay solid. And the storm came in my life, and it came hard. I had graduated from this program. I had, gra I had gone to a Christian college. I had met a gentleman in the local church. I had gotten married. I had ended up in a very dark, dark marriage. And the harm done to me the harm done to my children, the disruption, the pain. It was, it, it made this quiet heart really, really doubt. To the point where I would say I had but yet a mustard seed left. So thank goodness for mustard seeds and that that is absolutely enough. When I speak to single moms and I teach some classes, we talk about this idea of attachment because a lot of times we've come from places where we were attached like this with maybe a spouse 
and we've become unattached. And it's been in a way that has caused us to question at our core if we have any worth, if there is anything good left in us, or if we were just now made to be second string. Those are hard words. But when you've been attached and you detach in that kind of violent nature, you wonder, is God worth trusting or is the same thing going to happen? And we talk about attachment in our ministry as these hands threading together. And if you think about a little child, you get attached as soon as that child's born. You get attached before that child's born. And then you have shared memories and you have little sayings. I nannied a nine-year-old who is now this beautiful woman, and she and her husband have just had their first child. And I happened to nanny her because her mom was a single mom. And they would always say this, I love you always. I love you more. And so... What, depending on what side you're on with the tattoo thing. They just got tattoos. One got always, and one got more. And that's attachment. That's their thing. They count on each other in that way. And so we talk about understanding attachment in a continual saying yes to Jesus. And my posture, my learning to abide after everything in this world seemed to have crumbled, started with me literally laying on the floor and saying one thing, God, I'm with you. I couldn't tell you at that time what that meant. I would tell you there was nothing deeper than those words. That's that mustard seed. Lord, I have no idea how I'm going to raise my one and three-year-old. I have no idea where any money is going to come from. I have, I have no idea about anything. I believe you're redeeming, but I think you're going to redeem through my children. But for myself, I don't think I'm ever going to have a life again. But I'm going to stay with you. And that little mustard seed was enough. Because then over time... He started to show me. He started to show me that first, he was my bedrock. I studied the book of Psalms. When you're a single mom and you're raising little kids and you don't have help, your nights and your weekends are radical. They're on the couch by yourself. And you have lots of time to choose what you're going to ingest and what you're going to do. And I would read the word and I would put the Psalms inside me. And I started to accept that new foundation that absolutely, no matter what storm, the words that Elizabeth Elliot preached over and over and over again, that abiding heart, that's where it was at. He is who he says he is. Therefore, I am who he says I am. And laying that bedrock. And then understanding the next level of this attachment, he kept showing me that he was my father. There are probably so many good fathers in this audience, and you want goodness for your children. And when you show that, they're attaching deeper and deeper to you. And God started replacing the hurt from the past and the harm and showing me that he would provide and protect, that he was this good father, that he was the covering over my home and that I would lack nothing. This was me living literally in poverty. But realizing if I never earn another cent, I'm still so rich because he is my father, and my position and your position is sons and daughters. And then from the bedrock, it went into learning that I was his beloved, that husbandry. And when you have had a split like I've had, that's a radical concept, because it's like, I don't know if I can go there. I can remember the day that seed started in me, that stirring, that I was actually beloved by him. And I went like this to God, no, I can accept you as bedrock, I can accept you as father, but do not ask me to attach to you deeper. I still want control here. I still want, because I might get hurt, and I'm not sure I can handle that. But he kept coming, and he kept coming, and the more experiences we have, 
I remember laying on my bed, having no co-parent, and having a daughter in the hallway having a full-blown screaming tantrum. And I remember laying on the floor and being, and saying, God, I don't even have anyone to ask what to do right now. And I'm about to lose it. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And ever so quietly on my heart, it was, just go hold your daughter. I will tell you that was not going to be my answer. (laughs) It was going to be the opposite. And I went out there and I scooped her up and I held her. And it was amazing what transformed after that. That was the answer. And he was proving that he was the head of our home. And therefore, what do you think it did for me? Attach. I'm going to attach even deeper with you, Lord. I saw miracle after miracle, ways in which he provided. The start of this ministry makes no sense. It was the biggest earthly risk I might have ever taken. I had a judge in town tell me, I'm not real certain you're putting the best interest of your children first. And it was a fair question. I knew in my heart I was, but on paper, this did not look like a good, (laughs) rational decision as a single mom. And yet, and yet he provided, but it was hard. And sometimes in our relationship with God and I, we rip. Now it's never his fault. It's my fault. It means... I'm not going to abide in you. I don't trust you there. So I'm going to go like this. But because we've attached a tear, even a big tear, it can be mended. And that was the radical nature of learning that abiding had everything to do with going and making disciples. Because when we have the bedrock, we can't be shaken. Nobody can take that reality from us. I spent years being bitter of everything that was taken from me. The fact I couldn't go back for an education. I couldn't go down the vocational pathway I wanted. I had to remain within 90 miles of Traverse City because of a court order. I couldn't do this or I couldn't do that. And it was, I felt bitter. And yet I realized, I realized that no, it was God hemming me in. Yes, through very earthly things, but that God was sovereign. And when we're that firmly rooted, we have the ability to be calm and peace-filled and respond then in kindness, in gentleness, and with respect. We don't have to yell because we're sure-footed and we're steadfast. And I found myself drawn again and again to Paul's teaching. And at Single Mom, we meditate on this scripture all the time. And we meditate with women on this scripture all the time. And this, to me, is such a heartbeat of living a life abiding in him so that when we abide in him and fill with that Holy Spirit, we can turn out and we can produce disciples. We can give out of the abundance that God is putting in our heart. This is Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. When I meditate on these words, if I look at it as in rings, my spirit becomes more alive. It's awfully hard to get cranky when you're meditating on things that are praiseworthy. (laughs) It's such a good practice. Um, But my spirit becomes more alive. Then that renews my mind. 
And then that renews actually my body because, right, we're body, mind, spirit. And that gives me the ability to use my feet and my hands and my heart and my whole being to minister, to go out and to be relational. This is the place where we go from. We don't have to wait for perfection. We absolutely do not have to wait for perfection. He's at work transforming us the moment we say yes. We live spirit day by day. He works through us as we journey, but we go abiding in him. So let's look at the actual call to go. Go and make disciples. For 13 years, I've been immense in the work of working with women and children. Their past, their pains, their hurts, their doubts, their abandonment, their rejection creates a significant resistance to wanting to attach with our loving Father. It is hard to imagine that God is good. Our work at Single Mom, my staff, myself, were story listeners. If I was going to do a tattoo, which I'm not, <laughs> it would say 1,000 plus because I've gathered 1,000 plus stories. And though I don't carry them in regards to they're the Lord's and I lay them down, I remember them. I know them. I love them. I'm for them. And I grieve for the pain that they've been through. But that's part of going. Because in going, you wake up in the morning, you say, good morning, dear Jesus. This day is for you. How? How do I do today? I don't actually pray more than that in the morning. That's exactly what I pray, if you want to know. I'm driving, and that's what I pray. <laughs> and it's putting my heart in a posture that's saying, Jesus, help. I can't do today on my own. It's wholly saying, I'm going to abide in you, and I have to trust you. And then it's leaning further in. It's leaning into those spaces that do make us grieve, to not withdraw from the pain of this world because we have the answers to the pain in this world. We have to be willing to lean in. Or you didn't get the privilege of seeing my red muck boots today because my feet would sweat. <laughs> but sometimes I wear red muck boots when I talk because it's a representation of you've got to get in the mud that's where people are. That's where I've been. That's where I still go today, to be honest, in my imperfection. And we've got to lean in. Our differential, if we were doing a marketing campaign, our differential as Christians in a world full of info, and you can get info anywhere, social media, Google, I mean, Word, when we come out of here, we're just going to get more and more info. We are not giving more words we are literally giving the character of God. What a differential. You know the Christian song, they know we are Christians by our love. Yeah, it's our differential. God's kindness leads us to repentance. It's how we repent. Therefore, when we're operating and abiding by him and we're trying to make disciples, it overflows in our kindness to them is drawing them in. And what we see with women is, that have been abused specifically, they draw and they will attach to us first. And I kind of used to get alarmed with this, and then I went and studied, back actually down in Texas, with a gentleman that does a lot of this work, and he said, it's okay, listen, they're attaching to the spirit in you, and as they attach to you, they're then going to see what the truth is because you're going to give testimony because you're going to say when I have women come in and tell me something I don't have the answer so what I say is Jesus help and then they know part of the testimony as they start to heal and walk forward is that there was one woman that said Jesus and asked Jesus to come into the situation even if they're not ready to do that. So we testify to our goodness and it transforms hearts. 
because we can't help but proclaim his goodness, right? And the beauty in that is a new disciple then is born. And there's the Great Commission on our local ground, in our neighborhood, in your family, in your church, in the local ministries surrounding this. We specifically see this in terms of we watch women come through our door and then they help other women rise up. And as they help the women rise up, this is what it can look like. One of our women came through the door 11 and a half years ago, right before Randy. She had five kids. She had come from a horrific situation of abuse. She was shattered. And she had detached so much from the Lord. And we worked with her, and we talked with her, and we had confidence, and we had hope, and we imagined for her. And eventually she said yes to going back to school. Eleven years later, she's about to graduate. Do you know who's going to be there? All of us. We're going to be cheering her on. And in that, what's more beautiful than schooling, even though she's going to be a social work and she's going to give right back into this community and help other women overcome, more beautiful than that is, and she will tell you, she learned to attach to us and the God she saw in us. And then one night when she couldn't get us on the phone, she realized, I can take this to the Lord. And she's been doing it every day since, and she ministers to the other women. So we serve a good, good God, and we're surrounded by goodness. So thank you so much for being goers and doers of the word. It is an honor to be in community with all of you.